Greetings. Welcome to the area of managing quality. Today we will be discussing the various concepts of how to manage quality within an organization. We'll define quality and total quality management, also known as TQM. We'll describe the ISO International Quality Standards. We'll go that in overview. We will not be into depth. We will explain the Six Sigma concept. We'll explain how benchmarking is used in total quality management. We'll explain quality robust products and the Taguchi concepts. And finally, use the seven tools of total quality management. When we look at managing quality, managing quality supports differentiation, low cost, and responses to strategy. The quality itself helps firms increase sales and reduce costs. Building a quality organization is a demanding task, both financially and managerially. Now, we can look at two ways of improving quality. We can look at sales being gained by an improved response, flexible pricing, improved reputation. We can also reduce the cost of manufacturing the products or servicing. How do we do this? Well, we can go ahead and increase productivity. That's one of the ways to reduce costs. Another way is to lower the rework and scrap costs associated with the creation or development of the product. And of course, lower warranty costs. When you put all these together, you have an increased potential of profits. One of the things we look at in increasing the flow of activities within an organization is the organizational practices in itself. Those of you who've already gone through the organizational management portion of the course uh, or of your uh, program would understand the concepts that it is important to have leadership inside the organization, including the mission statement and effective operating procedures. Additionally, you need quality staff support and in order to maintain that quality staff support, continuous developmental training. What does this all yield? Well, it yields the important factors of improving one's ability to conduct operational changes, flexibility, and adaptation to the environmental factors that are always impacting an organization. Quality principles include items like being customer focused. We're always looking at being a continuous improvement. In fact, in most of the organizations that I have been either the, the head of or the chairman of the board of that I currently am, we are continually striving to improve the business itself. We don't step in our laurels because if you do, you're going to be left behind. The environment is continuously changing. The technology is one of the major factors of constant change within our environment. In the, financials, in the financial world, what we look at is also the environmental changes that impinges upon us by the value of money in itself, the interest rates the Federal Reserve plays for us, what are other banks and credit unions doing in providing financial structure for, for our customers, because everybody is looking to attract the customers of somebody else. It's not a closed environment. It is an open environment. Consequently, we're all striving for the market share. That is important. That is important to understand. It's not a closed environment. Consequently, because we're striving for others' environmental, uh, other environmental market shares, we need to improve ourselves. We need to continuously provide better tools, better financial resources for our customers. The same thing then also for a city, which I used to be the, uh, the manager for, constantly improving how do I lower the millage rate while increasing the value of our services. That is the customer-focused attitude. Additionally, we have things like just-in-time inventory, where you go ahead and get, and we discussed this a little bit in, previous, in a previous uh, class, but just to refresh your memory, it's where you do not hold uh, any type of inventory, or you, you try to hold as minimal inventory as possible, and you make coordination with other um, entities that are your third-party vendors that bring in those uh, items that you need. This can be very well done in manufacturing, uh, if you're doing vehicle repairs, uh, or any type of uh, concept where you need stock. 
stock costs, if you're keeping it, stock costs money. Consequently, the less stock you have, the better it is for you, while at the same time making sure that you are providing the best quality product and services to your customers. And then we're going to be discussing a concept called tools of quality management at the very end, but I just want to make sure everybody knows that the concept of quality principles include these tools. The heels of this is how do you how to do what is important and to be accomplished in those in those areas. The next level of the flow activity and how to improve your business is employee fulfillment. We try to go ahead and empower our, our employees. They make decisions at the lower level by following and aligned with the strategic focus of what we set on the board of directors and the CEO. There is some form of organizational commitment. If you empower them, they will be more committed to the organization than if you just make them do things on their own. The yields to this empowerment is employee attitudes are going to dramatically change towards the accomplishment of what is important for the organization. They literally become part of the organization. The last in the flow of activities is the customer satisfaction. This is the ultimate experience because what you're doing is this, you're trying to check to see if you have met the needs and expectations of your customers. The orders that they place, are they on time? Did they get placed appropriately? Was there a delay? Was there not? Are these going to be repeat customers? Because you're always trying to have repeat customers. The yield of this is an effective organization with a competitive advantage. When we define quality, we say that it is an operations manager's objective to build a total quality management system that identifies and satisfies customer needs. This is not an easy task. It sounds like it is, but it is not. The total totality of this feature is, hot, is very encompassing. Consequently, there are various characteristics of a product or service that bears on its ability to satisfy the stated, the stated or implied needs towards the customer. There are different views uh, regarding what the customer wants and how we manage and produce our products. One is the user base. In other words, we focus on the user and we try to create better performance and you know more, more features along with it. You can look at this as the PDA. Everybody, more than likely, everybody has a, a PDA. The important factors of a PDA is that not only does it, is it a telephone, I, it is. The key note is here is that it's not just a phone or else we just call it a phone instead of a PDA, personal digital assistant. It also has the calendar. The calendar is synced with that of your home, with that of your enterprise area, or with something in the cloud, or, you know, a uh, calendar in the cloud. You can have multiple calendars that are united and create features that allow you to keep time management to a T, to an instant. There is calculator function. There are reader abilities for Word, Excel, PowerPoints. Literally, your PDA is a miniature computer. It does not allow you to go ahead and save the volume of documents that we're used to in a laptop or in a standalone uh, desktop computer, but it does allow you to keep enough, uh, enough data in there to satisfy the needs for a periodic basis. We look at manufacturing base. This is conformance to standards, making it right the first time. Remember we mentioned in our little, uh, in our objective side about the ISO, well, there's ISO 9000, there's ISO 14,000, uh, and so on. Each one is, is specifically for a different area of manufacturing. But in the international world, that is the standard. ISO is the standard for the manufacturing standards of compliance with first time being right and very low to hardly any errors. Then there's one called the product base, the specific and measurable attributes of the actual product. The implications of quality are the company's reputation. In my organization, we're constantly promoting our name brand. So what we do is, is if we have issues that tarnish that name brand, we have got to solve the issue quickly. It is the importance of company reputation because if we don't take care of our branding, if we don't take care of our reputation, 
people will look at our branding and, and say, we don't want to shop there, or we don't want to have that financial institution as ours. And we have to do a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift in itself is how do we allow people to know about our product, to know that our product are the best in the market, and to attract new members or new people, uh, new customers. That is the company's reputation. Every time we issue a new product out, our company's reputation is on the line. That is the reason that we, before we issue anything out, we do a beta testing. Ironically, the board of directors and the member and the uh, actual employees are the people who test, who do beta testing. Once we confirm that the uh, that the protocols are correct and our services are online and synced and can communicate well with our hierarchy of uh, nodes, then we issue it out to the rest of the the financial institution community. One of the key areas that we look at at the company's reputation is also employment practice. Are we reasonable? Do we follow the laws, you know, U.S. laws in regards to employment? Do we follow international laws in the areas of employment when we have an international market and we are in different countries? Then there's the company's reputation with supplier relations. How is this important? Well, it's important because if you don't pay on time, if you're always behind on payments, you are going to be looked at as an individual or a company that they don't want to do business with. You're also going to lose your ability to have a net 30, a net 45, which means you have the product now, but you're paying within 30 days or 45. This is clearly an important advantage if you're allowed to do this because your cash flow could improve exponentially by this. Uh, it's a mini loan, basically what you're being at, what you're being given. So it, it's important to have these supplier relationships the best possible way. Then there's the product liability and reduce of risk. The product liability that you manufacture, if it's right the first time, it has reduced risk. If you decide to take shortcuts and the, re, the reduced risk is exponentially increased, consequently, your products will not, will not have a good uh, name, name recognition. In fact, your company's reputation would dwindle based on a product. I'm sure that some of you can go ahead and think of some products that are not good and consequently diminished and tarnish the reputation of the company that produced them. I'll give you an example. Mercedes-Benz is considered an elite vehicle of choice and it is it's for those with discretionary incomes that is high in, 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 in value. Consequently, you would expect that a Mercedes-Benz vehicle is safe and drives very good. The majority of them are, and they still regain a good reputation. Unfortunately, their Taguchi um, airbags had issues, and they began to re re collect them all. Consequently, the information that they put out, the communication that they put out was very important because they did not want the company's reputation to be tarnished. So they set up schedules on how to do the replacement. The replacements are for free, etc. The key, though, is, is that they already did put in bad airbags. Consequently, now the, they, they are fighting the uphill battle of improving and sustaining the company's reputation. That's why it's important to make sure that your risks are minimized and that you take care and ensure that when you have a risky at, uh, risky action taking place, that you have mitigating and secondary sources available to you to ensure that your company's reputation remains untarnished. Then there's the implication for quality in the global aspect. And this includes improved ability to compete in a worldwide market. If you're able to sustain worldwide competition, you're doing good. Is it hard to do that? Of course it is. You have to put a lot of effort into this or else everybody would be doing it. So consequently, you have to fight the barriers to entry. You have to fight maintenance of the, uh, of the entry itself. Once you have, you've been passed through the barriers, it's always a constant pressure. Now, regarding total quality management, if you have total quality management, you usually get an award, right? 
and the award is, is sometimes, at least to, to a board of directors and CEOs and to the stockholders, is increased wealth. In fact, one of the things I tell all, all my uh, students, and at the same time, I tell all my employees, the importance of understanding the fact that their job as business people is to increase and maximize stockholders' wealth. That's an important aspect that you must understand. If your organization fails under any circumstance, at least if it's a for-profit, even not-for-profit organizations have to do this, if you fail to maximize stockholders' wealth, if you don't change things around quickly and have a great plan of changing things around, don't expect to retain your job. This is serious information because as long as you understand everything is good, all, all that you do is wonderful, the problem is only if you have maximized stockholders' wealth. What does that mean? Does it mean that you have to immediately have, you know, have great net income, etc.? Yes, that helps. The important thing is, is for for-profit organizations, for-profit corporations, they usually are stockholders. So by increasing the stock price in itself or the dividend rates, you have you are now increasing and maximizing stockholders wealth. TQM was, you know, but aside from that one, their TQM has something called the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. It was established in 1988 by the United States government and it was designated to promote total equality uh, management practices. Recent winners include the Midway USA Charter School of San Diego, Mid-America Transplant Services, Hills County Memorial, Price Waterhouse Cooper Public uh, Sector Practices, etc. Now, there's a commonality of all these enterprises, and that is that they are public sector or aligned with the public sector. The Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award is for the public sector. They wanted to institute the same, the same, uh, same items that TQM did. For the, for the private sector in the public sector. Some of the Baldrige criteria includes leadership, strategic planning, customer focus, measurement, analysis, knowledge management, workforce focus, operations focus, and of course, the one that has the most points, because everything, all, all that I've mentioned for you have points, but the one that has the most points are results. It does not matter that you have outstanding leadership. It does not matter that you have superior strategic planning, forecasting, you do great in analyticals, and you do outstanding operations. But if your results are meager, you do not satisfy the Baldrige criteria. Operations is important, results driven only. So as long as you're results driven focused, you're going to be good. Now, remember when I spoke a little bit about ISO? Well, it's an international recognition. Now, that's what I'm going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about right now is ISO 9000, the International Quality Standard. International recognition is important for some organizations because your product is going to be sold in a global market at one point or another, or at least we hope. Consequently, if you want your products to be globally recognized, it's, it's important to, for people to believe that your product is trustworthy and reliable. So the ISO 9000 International Quality Standard will go ahead and give you a rating, and if your rating is high enough, then people will have confidence in your product line. It does encourage uh, quality management procedures. It's constantly being reviewed. It details documentation, work instructions, and record keeping. In 2015 revision of the ISO 9000, it gives greater emphasis to risk-based thinking than it did previously. Over 1 million certifications in 206 countries were issued by 2015. ISO 9000 International Quality Standards is a critical component for global business. Let's look at some of the management principles in the ISO 9000. Top management leadership is crucial. Are you providing direction, strategic direction that is? Are you giving strategic goals? Is the mission statement actually a mission statement or is it just a, a political or uh, a 
advertisement campaign, you decided to go ahead and put it as a mission statement. Since your mission statement should go on all the documents that are that have that bear the financial statements. Many companies have done this. If you look at Nike, if you look at Oracle, they have you know what I consider to be marketing type missions. When in reality, it's different when you have a mission statement from top leadership management. It should say your mission statement, what your company does at the actual moment. What are your employees motivated? How are they motivated? And of course, how are you making your stakeholders a great part of the organization? If you have mentioned those three key areas, because believe me, the stakeholders want to know if you're going to maximize your stockholders' wealth. Now, customer satisfaction is an important aspect. How are you going to keep the customer happy? Continual improvements is important because you want to have dynamic changes taking place in your organization on a continuous basis to ensure that you're keeping up in the with the environmental changes that are occurring. Involvement of people in making decisions. It also creates buy-in, process analysis. In operations management, we learn quite a bit about process analysis. We look at it from a quantifiable basis, and we also look at it from a qualitative basis. We just don't do qualitative, even though in some cases people feel that's the easiest one. It actually is not. It's, it's more cumbersome. It's harder. The quantitative basis is a lot easier, but people get scared because there's math involved. I assure you, math is not your enemy. Get, get used to math. It is an important aspect of the business enterprise. Quantitative aspects are easier than qualitative only because you there's there's little room for interpretation once you set the benchmarks. You either meet it or you didn't. The question is, why didn't you meet it and or why did you meet it and how to and continuously improve it? It also involves the ISO 9000 International Quality Under Management Principle involves people. How do you integrate their, their functionalities within the organization and how do you engage them? Process analysis, as we spoke about already, is a key aspect of understanding the flow. Where are your choke points? How do you improve the reliable, how do you improve the flow through those choke points? Do you, do you have too many nodes within the flow chart itself? Use the data-driven decision-making process to help you understand where are your issues, where are your weaknesses. A system approach to management is also is a, is a, a very important aspect of this quality management standard because if you understand the systems approach, you will understand how your business operates. Therefore, your improving the systems will also improve processes within the organization. You also try to establish mutually beneficial supplier relationships. I mentioned this before. Pay on time. The supplier will be happy. The supplier, on the other hand, has to bring your, the products over to you on time and how you want it. The key point of quality is it doesn't come cheap. It's not something you can just pop out of the air, have an imaginative idea of wanting to go ahead and have quality control. Some of the stuff are inherent, like financial accounting being accurate, business management statistics actually, you know, being done. But there is a part, and that is prevention costs. If you do reduce the potential for defects, you need to have insured quality. In a manufacturing arena, this insured quality means that every time you have a run, you put a pause, and in that pause, you check to see that the goals or the specific attributes of that property or that uh, manufacturing property that you have are within the specifications assigned. In some aspects, we've already learned that there's an upper, upper control limit and upper and lower control limit. Well, you want to be within those control limits to make sure that you are within the specified realms of the product uh, product market definition. Appraisal cost. Evaluating product parts and services is an important aspect of, of appraisal cost because you need to know how much is your, is your product worth, how much is your company worth. Another thing is internal failure cost. 
How much is it going to cost your company when your service failed? When your product failed? Now, I have bought many products that when I turn them on, it didn't work. I went ahead and turned it back in. The person at the, at the, at the location says, here, we can go ahead and do an exchange. And he goes, no, no, I, I would like my money back. I'm going to try to go someplace else and see if I can purchase something that is comparable. All right. Remember, there are either comparable or substitutes. If there is, then you th this internal failure cost is important to understand because some, they'll go to someplace else. Your customers will go someplace else. All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about the cost of, of quality itself. When you do an appraisal, let us assume that if you can imagine uh, a, a chart whereby the x-axis is total cost and the y-axis is quality improvements. Obviously, you want to go ahead and have quality improvements. The issue at hand is, is that as you increase your improvements, so increases the cost of doing the operation. What you're looking to see is how to go ahead and increase your improvements. We know you have to go ahead and pay for that quality improvement aspect, so it's going to increase your cost. But if you could piggyback on multiple areas of the organization to increase the improvements itself, while at the same time piggybacking on those costs, then your appraisal, which is the how much the improvements are going to cost, the appraisals could be substantially reduced. So that's one way of doing it. The next cost of quality is prevention. How do you prevent accidents? How do you prevent risk? How do you prevent the organization's products to, def to go and default, et cetera? There's, a, there's the internal uh, failure rates that occur, and then there's the external failure rates that occur. As you increase the total cost itself, and by the way, the total cost of quality or of improvements are the appraisal cost plus the prevention cost plus your internal failure cost plus your external failure cost. That's the total cost. What you're trying to do, remember, still imagine that you are on this graph with the x-axis being, uh, or your y-axis being total cost, your x-axis being quality improvement. You're trying to go ahead and re continuously reduce all areas down as you're going to the right. So the further to the right you go in improving quality, the lower the cost would be. And that's what you're trying to achieve, not the inverse. You don't want to have a positive slope, you want to have a descending slope. Now, let's talk a little bit about Takumi. And Takumi is a sign that looks like an I and an, and an a, uh, an S, a squared out S. It is a Japanese character that symbolizes a broader dimension than quality a deeper process than education, and a more perfect method than persistence. So, if you understand Takumi, you'll, not, you'll quite understand a total philosophical concept in Japan. Let's talk a little bit about the leaders in the field of total quality management. My all-time favorite is uh, Edwards Deming. He is uh, one of the first ones on there. there there's, I actually have two, two two very important guys in my uh, in my life when I talk about the field of quality improvement and quality management. Of course, Edward Deming is one. Deming assisted managements accept responsibility for the building good systems. The employees cannot produce products that are average, ex and the average exceed the quality of what the process is capable of producing. He provided 14 points for implementing quality improvements are, and that are present in, in, in your textbook and in this course. The key to Edward Deming is is he revolutionized the way we look at quality. He didn't want things to be uh, developed in any manner to be defective. He wanted to have as close as perfection as you can. He was also an excellent time manager. He did time motion studies to go ahead and figure which is the best and fastest way to do it, reduce overall costs while improving the product's quality. The next individual is, of course, another one, it's my second favorite, and that is Joseph M. Giron. Most of you have heard of him or maybe not, but those of us who have been in the field for quite a bit of time understand both of them, Deming and Duran. Duran is a, was a pioneer in, in teaching the Japanese how to move quality. Imagine that. We all right, taught the Japanese how to improve quality. Duran believed strongly in top management commitment. 
support, and involvement in equality efforts. He was also a believer in teams that continuously sought to raise the quality standard. Sound familiar? I just mentioned that in my organization, we are constantly looking how to improve. We look inward. We see our processes and how to improve. We, look, we do this as a team. It's not directed by me or my CTO. It's directed wholly. We hold lessons learned on a, on, a, on a monthly basis. We have weekly meetings where we talk about the, you know, what's going on the following week. In other words, we don't keep our employees as mushrooms. We keep our employees very well, uh, you know, very well under, um, informed through proper communications. That's one of the Joran's keynotes. It was also Deming's. Right? So, since he believed in teams, I thought, what the heck, I might as well do that same thing. So, continuously seeking through teams to raise the quality standards, that's one of the key components of Joran's thoughts. Joran varied from Deming somewhat in focusing on the customer and defining quality as a fitness for use, not necessarily for the written specification. That's very important to understand. In Deming's case, he said he believed that if you wrote and specified through an engineering study that these are the parameters, then those are the parameters. Deviation is not appropriate. Joran, on the other hand, is more flexible. It's not that the deviate from the parameters is sometimes the whole product has to change, and sometimes customers didn't want perfection. They want a cheaper price. So you gave it to them, understanding that there would be a minor a uh, higher, a minor level of, a minor higher level of risk, with the product being defective. But customers were willing to put up with that. Then there is an individual called Armand Feigenbaum. His 1961 book entitled "Total Quality Control" laid out 40 steps to quality improvement processes. Yes, 40 steps. That's probably why you've never heard of them. Right? Um, but it's important to know him because we get some of his information uh, and he did contribute something to the operations management field. Then there's Philip B. Crosby, uh, where quality is for you, was Crosby's attention getting book published in 1979. Crosby believed that in the traditional trade-off between the cost of improving quality and the cost of poor quality, the cost of poor quality is understand understated. The cost of poor quality should include all of the things that are involved in not doing the job right the first time. All. So therefore, there's absolutely no reason for having errors or defects in any product or service, according to Crosby. When we think about total quality management, we also have to ensure that there is some ethics in the quality movement. Operations managers must deliver healthy, safe, quality products and services. If it's built wrong or if it's built right, but it can cause harm, it is the ethical standard to alert management that this product can cause harm. I'll give you an, uh, a case in point. Everybody understands now that cigarettes is hazardous to your health. It can produce cancer, specifically lung cancer, but there's other cancers that it can produce. Well, back in the, in the late 40s or 40s and 50s and on, cigarettes were not thought of as a bad thing. The keynote is on our ethical standard. It has come to our attention in the recent past that the management, senior management of these cigarette companies knew that it was an attachment to health issues. And they hit it. When the lawsuits came over forth and everybody started speaking up, an unethical climate occurred. Consequently, millions of dollars were distributed to people that had been injured by the cigarette movement, cigarette movements of the 1930s, 40s, 50s, etc. Consequently, my wholehearted and recommendation that I could give you is always look at your product with an ethical view. If you don't, you may look good today, but at the end, you're going to look terrible. Consequently, look good today, right? But ethically, if it costs a little bit of more money to go ahead and make a product safer, more reliable to your customers, do it. 
poor quality risk injuries. So if you have a business enterprise that promotes fast-paced business enterprising, but at the risk of your employees and the lives of others, prepare yourself for lawsuits, recalls, and regulation. I just mentioned one of the recalls, which is the airbags, you know, that Mercedes-Benz had. But have you wondered why it is that the that no longer do the pizza industry people that do delivery that they tout the fastness of their their delivery? And it's because some of these pizza delivery persons would go so fast, running red lights, turning right without stopping, and on and on, and they would have caused accidents. So your pizza was late anyway, but there was somebody that was involved in an accident. So they had to stop that because they were put in lawsuits. And that, of course, lawsuits caused the panic and the pain. Ethical conduct must also dictate a response to the problem. If you know about a problem and you don't take action for it, you will, will be held accountable for it in a court of law. All stakeholders must be considered when you're making ethical decisions, including the corporate board and your stakeholders, which include your stockholders. Continuing on with total quality management, we know that it encompasses the entire organization from a supplier to the customer, everybody, and all the stakeholders. It stresses a commitment by management to have a continuing company-wide drive towards achieving excellence in all aspects of products and services that are important to the customer. After all, isn't that why you're the manager? Let's go over Deming's 14 points. The first is to create consistency of purpose. The second is to lead to promote change. The third is to build quality into products. Stop depending on inspections to catch the problem. If you do that, sometimes the inspections let you down. But if you focus on quality product in the beginning, you stand a very good chance that all your products are going to come out ahead. Build long-term relationship based on performance instead of a warning business on a price. There have been many a times that I have had people come in with the cheapest price, and I have paid more to correct issues that when but I would have gone with the highest price of the three bids that I had before. Continuously improve quality, product, and services. Do train. Emphasize proper leadership. Drive out the fear of making a mistake. Hold people accountable. Don't, make, don't get me wrong. I don't want you thinking, oh, so-and-so made a mistake. It cost us $100,000. Let's forgive them. We want a, a culture of, of not being fearful. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Drive out fear of making decisions but hold people accountable of the decision that they make. If they cost the organization a lot of money, hold them accountable. But at the same time, if they make a, if they make a decision and it is a wrong decision to make, coach, mentor, even if it costs a lot of money, you're holding them accountable, but you're coaching and you're mentoring. No one decision should end a person's career unless it's a decision that is catastrophic in nature. Most financial decisions are not catastrophic in nature. All right? But if you do sexual harassment, if you do uh, any sexual misconduct, if you discriminate, if, in other words, any of the Title VII movements, you could be fired. So those are, those are the factors that you don't want to drive out too quickly to fear. You want to make sure that there is rules and rules and regulation put in place. What you want to do is decision-making process for the betterment of the organization. Don't be scared to make decisions. Break down barriers between departments. Don't stovepipe them. Make sure they connect, they talk to each other. You'll see a vast improvement in the way your business is being run. Stop haranguing both workers. Treat them with respect. Treat them honorably. Support, help, and improve all your members within the organization. Remove barriers to pride in work. People do good work, they should be proud of it. Institute a vigorous program of education and self-improvement, and of course, put everyone in the company to work on the transformation, not just senior management. Those 14 points are very important. So please, review them in your textbook and review it in this live chat. 
on a periodic basis. There are seven concepts to total quality management. One of them is continuous improvement. The other is Six Sigma. Employee empowerment, benchmarking, just-in-time inventory, Taguchi concept, and knowledge of TQ1 tools. Continuous improvements is never-ending process of continuously improving your organization. It covers all people within the organization, inside and out. Equipment, suppliers, materials, procedures, all of these continuously have to be improved. Every operation within an organization can be improved. Now, there's a, there's a model called the Schuhart's PDCA model. Your textbook has it, um, and it's a, it's a circle divided into four quadrants. On the upper right-hand corner is your quadrant of planning. It identifies the pattern and makes a plan itself. Then you go to the lower right hand. If you're looking at it, it looks clockwise. So you're, it flows clockwise itself. Now, so imagine that you have, you know, the circle with the four quadrants. The first one's planning, and it's on the, you know, from one o'clock from from midnight to three o'clock, and that's plan. It identifies the pattern of, uh, to make a plan. Then in your three to to six o'clock, you do it. You test the plan. You check the plan all the way till you get to the nine o'clock. Uh, is the plan working itself or not? And then the final one is you act it. You actually implement the plan. That's called, par you know, we do parallel track planning. We do parallel uh, initiatives. Why? Because when we go ahead and do a switch over, we want to make sure that it's properly done. So we normally do all of our testing in a virtual, in a virtual area, you know, either a virtual campus or a virtual uh, bank, etc. We do that there. Once it meets the standards of sufficiency and, um, effectiveness, then we switch over, not before. Continuous improvements also have what's called Kaizen, that's spelled K-A-I-Z-E-N. Kaizen describes the ongoing process of unending improvement. It's a way of life and a philosophy in Japan. Total quality management and zero defects also are also used to describe continuous improvements. In Six Sigma, it has two meanings. The first is statistical. It's a definition of a process that is 99.9997% capable. That is 3.7 defects per million opportunities. All right. The second meaning is it is a program designed to reduce defects, lower costs, save time, and improve customer satisfaction. So a comp it is a comprehensive system for achieving a sustaining business success. When you look at six, 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 Six Sigma, what you are looking at is six standard deviations from the mean. That's why it's six Sigma. Your mean, obviously, if you remember, you have a, a uh, if, you, if you can, if you go ahead and think and, rem and imagine a, bell, a perfectly bell-shaped curve with equal tails out there. You have the, you know, the equivalent kurtosis on both sides. Your mean, obviously, is your center. And if you recall directly, it's a little you know, mean discussion there is, uh, that you have there, little, the mean symbol, like a uh, little U. Now, if you have three plus or minus standard deviation, you have 2,700 defects per million. If you have six standard deviations, I already mentioned it's 3.4 defects per million, and so on. So 99.9997% is what you're looking for in a six, six Sigma. The Six Sigma program uh, is originally developed by Motorola, adopted and enhanced by Honeywell and General Electric. Let's not talk about General Electric. They're having a hard time at this moment. Their stock price has definitely plummeted recently. So they're having major issues, and, but their products itself follow a six, six Sigma program itself. By the way, following Six Sigma approach does not mean that your company is going to be financially viable for, you know, continuously. You have to go ahead and include good financial management, uh, your leverage, which is one of General Electric's problems is the leverage itself. But, and, you know, too many loans. There were actually uh, so many loans that for capitalization improvements that they were doing that they out themselves and that caused a problem. 
your PE ratio, your price earning ratio is an important cornerstone of ensuring that you have appropriate levels of success within the market. Six Sigma is also a highly structured approach to process improvement. It is a strategy, a discipline, also known as a DMAIC, D-M-A-I-C, and a, seven of, a set of seven tools. Six Sigma, when you do the process, this is called the DMAIC approach, D-M-A-I-C, which is D stands for define. So you define the project's purpose, scope, and output that identifies the required process information, keeping in mind the customer's definition of quality. Remember, it's not your definition of quality, even though you do set it, but you should have paid attention to what the customer's desires are. So consequently, your definition of uh, quality is very similar, if not the exact, as that of your customer. Measures, Six Sigma measures the process and collects data, analyzes the data, ensuring repeatability and reproducibility, Sort of like a scientific management approach, right? You have to produce it and you have to reproduce it and it, it's got to be re, you know, in a repeated fashion. If not, it didn't exist. It, it was an anomaly and it, it shouldn't be considered a, a uh, continuous concern. Improves by modifying or redesigns existing processes and procedures and controls the new processes to make sure performance levels are maintained. Now, implementing Six Sigma emphasizes defects per million opportunities as a standard metrics provides extensive training to your people that are doing the measuring and or the performing, focus on top management leadership, the champions, creates qualified process improvement experts. There's the black belt, the green belt, yellow belt, the white belt, so on and so forth. Now there is a double black belt, and the double black belts are those that supervise the black belts. It sets stretch objectives. Well, the stretch objectives, as you may recall from some of your business courses, are those that are not just simple objectives, but those that push you a little further than your capabilities to accomplish. When you put all this, I, all this together, you got to understand that this cannot be accomplished without a major commitment from the top level management. Now, getting employees involved in product and process improvements is an important aspect of quality itself. 85% of the quality problems are due to the poor materials and processes. Techniques, build communication network that include employees, develop open supportive supervisors, move responsibility to employees, build a high morale organization, create formal team structures. It's, it's good to create also quality circles. I created these when I was in this, uh, when I used to be the human resources director for the city of Miami. We created groups of people who met regularly to solve issues. Now, there were various levels of quality circles. So we had uh, three levels. One, the one was the strategic level where we had directors and the, the, uh, the, the chiefs involved. Then we had the middle section of quality circles, which were the assistant directors and managers. And then we had the uh, operational side or the, where the rubber meets the road. And then we actually brought people that actually did the work, brought them in. And you'd be amazed at how a strategic component that everybody thought was easy to do and accomplish and to meet the goals, or when the operational side of the house, which is the lowest form, try to implement a strategy, the amount of effort needed was too large. In other words, too much energy, too much uh, endurance needed. The cost was out, out of its realm. Consequently, the feedback goes back up, and we had to, you know, it was modification. Very proud of these quality circles. And it's often led by a facilitator at the strategic level was me. My uh, labor relations specialist was this quality circle for the managers. And I had uh, technical experts that were the quality circle facilitators for the operations side of the house. So where the rubber met the road. And it's very effective when done properly. Benchmarking is something that's important and also misused and misguided. Determine what the benchmark is first, but make it realistic. Also choose a company that is at the top of its game in the same industry you're in. From that, a benchmark team, you know, when you form a benchmark team itself, it identifies the benchmark partners, collect and analyze benchmark information, and then take action to match or exceed those benchmarks. Don't pick some, don't pick a company that's the same as you, that has the same level of, of proficiencies and operations as you, because then you're benchmarking 
It's not pushing you forward. It's just keeping you status quo. Try to select a, comp a company or the company that is number one in your area. Now, the best cut practices for resolving customer complaints, obviously, as the customer is always right, but not all the time. You make it easy for your clients to complain. That's number one. Why? Because it, if there's free market research out there and people will start seeing that you actually help your customers. Respond quickly to complaints. It adds customers, you know, and loyalty to, you know, loyalty base. Resolve complaints on the first contact. It reduces your cost and it doesn't make the customer angry. Use computers to manage complaints and recruit the best for customer service in the area. Not everybody can be a customer service agent. Some customer service agents really get the customer angry while others pacify them. But they didn't, everybody, if the, the outcome was, this, was basically the same from the financial perspective, but outcomes differ from the psychological perspective. When you do internal benchmarking is when an organization is large enough. If you're a small corporation, if you're less than 500 employees, internal benchmarking may not be for you. Above 500 employees, maybe that's the time to do it. It creates data and that makes it more accessible and can and, can and should be established in a variety of areas. Now, we spoke about just in time, but let's go a little bit over it. It's, it is considered a pull system of production scheduling, including supply management. Production only when the signal. So that's why it's just in time. It's pull. I need it now. It allows reduced inventory levels so you don't have to keep stock on hand all the time. Inventory, remember, it costs money, so the less inventory you have, the less expenditures you have. It encourages improved processes and product quality. Relationships to quality. Just in time cuts the cost of quality. It improves quality. It's better quality means less inventory and, and better, easier to employ just in time systems. Now, I mentioned previously the Taguchi concept. It is an engineering and experimental design method that is for improving products and process design. It identifies key components and process variables affecting products variation. In other words, why do the products vary? And it may be that you need to go ahead and recalibrate certain sections of the production line, that's all. But you have to know when to do it. And there are companies that out of every time they produce the number 100 piece, they stop they recalibrate the machine and then they start back on. Does the, is that because at 100 is when they, the products have a higher propensity of being uh, manufactured with the wrong calibration? It's a possibility. They did their, their, did their studies and that's what they do. The Taguchi concepts are quality robustness, target oriented quality, and quality loss function. Quality robustness is the ability to produce products uniformly. In adverse manufacturing environmental conditions, remove the effect of adverse conditions. Small variations in materials and process do not destroy the product quality. Quality loss functions shows that costs increase as the product moves away from what, is the, what the customer wants. In other words, it's target-oriented quality. Costs include customer dissatisfaction, warranty and service, internal scrap and repair, and cost of society. Traditional conformance specifications are also too simplistic. Now, let's uh, look at the tools of total quality management. These include check sheets. Military loves check sheets. If you look at a pilot, especially the ones in the military, they take out their flight, their flight book standard and they start doing it. Nowadays, it's more electronic but they, they do the checklist to make sure that they check every piece of item and, and they use the checklist to prompt them. You never use a memorized checklist. You never know if you could get it one thing. And one thing can actually cause a catastrophe. Another tool for generating ideas is a scatter diagram. That's when you put little plots within the diagram. It looks like somebody had, you know, somebody went ahead and you know, shot it with a shotgun all over the place. But sometimes when you analyze it, it has patterns. Then there's the cause and effect diagram. Now, the tools that you can use to organize the data is the Pareto chart, the, pro the flow chart, also known as, as the process design program. Tools to identify pro problems include the histogram and statistical process control chart. 
So a check sheet is just that. You count the defects. All right. A, let's say you have a, you create a matrix. And on the one side, they're going to be going up and down. On the left-hand side column, going up and down, it's the defects of each one of the products. Defect A, B, C, whatever. Then on the other side is the hours that the defect occurs. So if you have a operation that is eight hours long and you have three segments that are working to create the product, let's see where the defect occur. When it goes, now, what is considered a defect? Not total failure, but when it goes outside of the upper control limit or below the lower control limit. If it's within those two limits, you know, then you're okay. Anything out of that is considered an outlier and a defect. So check, check sheet is because you're actually counting checks. So you go one, two, three, and then four, and then a five, cross and check, and then move on. That's all it is. That's the reason it's called a check sheet. Now you add up all those checks and you come up with a total amount of defects that have occurred within a specified period of hour. Uh, the scatter diagram is what I mentioned before. It is a, uh, a, a typical graph, the value of one variable versus another, and it looks very scattered, you know, dots everywhere. But it usually has a flow. If it doesn't have a flow, that means there's no relationship. The cause and effect diagram, also known as the fishbone diagram, and it looks like fish bones, with everything pointing towards the center and out towards an effect. The Pareto chart is... Uh, a graph that identifies that identifies where twenty, where eighty percent of your problem is caused by twenty percent of your issues. So you have the frequency on your y-axis and your causes on your x-axis, and then you you manipulate it where you put the majority of the, the the one that has the highest, and you go from highest to lowest. So the highest go on the 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 x side of the house, on the left hand side, and then as you grow to the right, it starts reducing because it's, you start off with the one with the highest. It's always that way. It always looked that way. And then your frequency, which is how many times it costs, goes up. And then your flow chart, it's a process diagram. It describes in the step process. It tells you how long it get, takes from point A to point B and how long it takes to do things. And then your histogram, we're all familiar with it. This, the, the typical distribution of the frequencies that are there and it, it looks very similar to a bell-shaped curve but using a histogram that's all the statistical process control chart is what we use to go ahead and identify upper limit and control limits with the middle line being the the value anything above like i mentioned before the control limit or below the control limit is considered an outlier a defect the closer you are to your target value the more precise you are to the conformity and then your cause and effect diagram, that is the fishbone. And, you know, you, you, and it's very useful to identify what causes the problems in itself. This concludes the, the, this concludes the uh, seminar that we're having at this time. And, but one thing I leave you with, all of this information that I've imparted, good knowledge, etc. But it's up to you as managers to actually physically do the inspections and sometimes go down. It doesn't, it doesn't matter where are you on the top. You can be the chairman of the board or you can be the CEO. Sometimes it's very good to go down into where production is happening. A, the people will look at you and, and see that you care. And B, you're actually witnessing a reality versus being told from management what is happening. You're actually seeing this is part of your inspection process. It's also a good thing to cause because you're doing management by walking about, which it does not limit you then to information. It actually improves your ability to gather information in the overall. With that, I thank you very much for listening, and I will see you next week.